to welcome everyone to our first meeting of the year. We haven't met since last year. Uh, so this is the diversion subcommittee meeting and welcome. I don't think we have any um, community folks on Zoom, but welcome to our one community person or two. <laughs> um, why don't we do a quick intro and um, of the committee members and then I'll ask the public to also introduce themselves. And I'll start. My name is Stephanie Medley. I'm with RISE and I am the chair of the Diversion Committee. And I'll go to my right. Uh, Alicia Jackson. I am a reentry manager at Hope Solutions and I'm community rep in seat number six. Mm -hmm. Simon. Simon O'Connell, uh, Chief Assistant, DA's Office. Peter Riz, Contra Costa Probation, Probation Manager. Hi, Ellen McDonald, uh, Contra Costa Public Defender. Thank you, everyone. And we'll start with our public, um, starting with Jill. <laughs> Jill Ray with the uh, Office of Supervisor Candace Anderson. Casey Rain, Rain Community Development. Thank you. Patrice Guillory, Office of Rain Tree Justice and Probation. And our guest on Zoom, if you could introduce yourselves. Chris. <laughs> Good afternoon, folks. Chris James with the W. Haywood Burns Institute. Thank you, sir. And Gary Anna. Hello, my name is Gary Anna Youngblood, and I'm with the ORJ. Thank you, everyone. Um, do we have one person yeah. coming? Two people coming in. A few more <laughs> members of the public. All right. Welcome, everyone. We're just finishing up with introductions. If you would like to introduce yourselves. Oh, um, my name is Stephanie Taddeo. I'm a member of the general public, um, and it was very um, concerned and wants to be wants to learn more. Thank you. And I'm Chris Taddeo, and I'm with Stephanie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, welcome. Um, are there any announcements before we get started? All right, so I will open it up for public comment, um, and this can be public comment on any items that are not on the agenda, um, but are within um, our jurisdiction. So I will open it up for any public comment. I'm sorry, Stephanie, Raina Moore is present and she didn't get to introduce herself. Raina, do you wanna introduce yourself? Uh, sure, um, my name is Rena Moore. I'm a credible messenger organizer with the Safer Term Project. And I also sit on cab as well. Thank you, Ariana. And welcome, Rena. Thank you. All right, so I'll open it up again for any public comment on any items that are not on our agenda today. All right, hearing none, we will move on to our next item, and that's the approval of our record of action from October 20th, 2022. Is that the last time? It's been a long time. It's been a long time. Um, are there any additions, corrections from committee members to the record of action? Oh, happy belated birthday, friends. And it's coming up again. <laughs> um, I'll open it up for any public comment on the record of action. All right, hearing that, can I get a motion from the committee to accept the record of action? I'll make that motion, Stephanie. Thank you, Simon. We have a motion from Simon. Can I get a second, please? Thank you, Tina. Um, and can we do a quick roll call vote? Patrice or Ariana? Absolutely. Uh, Stephanie Medley? Yes. Alicia Jackson? I'm staying. Simon O'Connell? Yes. Ellen McDonald? I'm going to have Steve. Tina Reyes. Yes. We have three yeses, two abstentions. Motion carries. 
Thank you, Gariana. <clears throat> All right, so we'll move on to item number four on our agenda. And this is to discuss and finalize the language for our eligibility criteria. Um, as many of you know, we have been working on eligibility criteria. We focused on um, the adult criteria um, for diversion over, I think it was over um, all of last year. And um, one of the things that came up is that we wanted to analyze data to ensure that we weren't, um, that the eligibility criteria was um, consistent with ensuring that we're reducing racial and ethnic disparities. Um, but also we know that there's been some issues with gathering data. Um, and so we're still working on that. We also talked about who actually holds the data um, and who can analyze that data. Um, however, uh, with the criteria, Simon worked on some of those criteria. I think Ellen did as well. And um, I know I'm missing somebody. Michael um, also worked on it. But we wanted to also move forward with this and not get caught up with still waiting for data, um, but also want to have some parameters on moving forward with it so that we can still ensure once we do have that data, we'll be able to make those adjust adjustments um, as needed to the criteria. Um, can I get somebody to read the um, statement that we made regarding the We the R job? It's on page six of our packet. All right, thank you. Uh, we the R job, in partnership with community and under the guidance of the Diversion Subcommittee, after careful discussion, review, and deliberation, ask the district attorney to accept and approve this document as official office policy for diversion eligible offenses effective immediately. We are requesting these changes to the diversion eligibility criteria for youth and adults to ensure that more individuals within each population are eligible for diversion programs and services so as to decrease the incarcerated population within the county as we believe it is possible to hold people accountable for these offenses and to address their needs without detaining them. Finally, we encourage that there is currently, excuse me, finally we acknowledge that there is currently a lack of data with which to project or analyze the racial impact of the diversion criteria set forth and request this criteria be used until sufficient data capacity to examine the racial impact is established, at which point these criteria should be examined and, if necessary, revised to eliminate any racial and ethnic disparities which may impact populations of color. It is with the understanding of all of the above that we request the DA's office to consider the following offenses, the only ones excluded from diversion eligibility and that persons charged with any offense besides those named below will be considered eligible for diversion. Thank you very much. Um, and so we don't have the attachment of the criteria, but we've gone over it before. Um, and that was only for adults. We still need to work on criteria for young people. Chris, is there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, um, so <laughs> thank you all for, for all of that. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, Stephanie, I think you gave a great uh, overview. Uh, what I would add is, number one, that um, in a conversation with D.A. Becton many moons ago, uh, she had already um, explained uh, that that she would be absolutely fine with um, moving something like this as uh, office policy, right, once we all uh, settled on criteria. So that's why, you know, that language is, is there, um, something that she, she was already in support of, of, of doing. Um, and additionally, right. As I was drafting this at first, uh, it, it took me a while to, to remember that we started with trying to name, um, the, the offenses that would be diversion eligible. And then Simon had the idea that it's probably easier to name the relatively fewer 
uh, offenses or charges that would not be eligible. So that's why there's that language in the bottom sort of clarifying that what we're saying is everything but what's listed here should be eligible for diversion. Um, and if there's a way to more more forcefully say that, um, I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, as always is the case, um, this is just, you know, a draft uh, for you guys to review and, and revise however uh, is necessary. But I, I think the main thing um, that I would point out is making sure that there's language to say when there's sufficient data, we want to uh, look at this again um, and make any necessary adjustments to make sure we eliminate disparities. Um, and that even though we did have adult population um, criteria and I could have attached it, I didn't uh, because it's been so long since we've seen it that it seems like, you know, before we would want to sort of move that forward, number one, I, I'd recommend that we do it all at the same time. Um, you know, that we, because we'll be waiting for, you know, a couple months um, for a, 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 a full body meeting. Um, and so rather than having two separate full body meetings to do the same thing, uh, we might be able to sort of tidy this all up and present it um, to the body in one meeting, but that's up to you guys to decide. Um, but outside of that, um, just that we want to make sure um, that we look at um, even the adult population uh, criteria that we've done and see if there has been any shift or if there's any discussion or clarification that we need to make on it. Because again, it's probably been since sometime on or before October 20th of last year that everyone looked at this and, and began to have those questions about data analysis. So I think those are the main uh, points to bring up. Thanks, Chris. Right, so we'll open it up now for the committee to discuss. <clears throat> and thank you for dropping this, Chris. I'll quickly speak on the data component. Um, I know this has uh, been a source of issue for everybody in the county. Um, and since the time that we last met on this topic in October, um, and Chris, thank you for giving the life arc um, of, of how we got back to here. Um, I really appreciate that. On data, um, I'm really excited to say we now have a data analyst within the district attorney's office. Um, Nicole Athola um, has been working wonders for us um, in looking at some of our internal metrics, as well as uh, some of our data that we produce. Um, so I'm hopeful um, that uh, I can take back our what is our draft of these diversion um, exclusionary crimes. And we can probably come back and share um, some of those statistics. I work a lot in partnership uh, with the PD's office and Brandon and Ellen on, on data on a number of issues. And we both recognize that um, our data coming out of uh, our case management system from the courts isn't great. And it's oftentimes a starting point for us to then do some individualized cleanup work. Um, but we're certainly moving in a very positive direction from where we were of, hey, we don't know how to utilize our data to now we have a data analyst who produces um, all sorts of reports for us, um, not in the aggregate of this is everything, but when it's specified like this, um, we can do some of that internal cleanup and make sure that that data is as accurate as possible. So I'm excited about that opportunity uh, to be able to share um, with this group. Thank you uh, for that update, Simon. Yeah, so so the idea is to, to workshop this language if we had suggestions. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think, um, thanks for putting this out, Christopher, putting it together. I think it does look really good. Um, I wonder if it would be a good idea to add what almost doesn't need stating, but maybe a sentence that um, diversion or diversionary opportunities um, address needs and root causes of individuals rather than um, furthering incarceration, which we as a uh, subcommittee or as the racial justice oversight body um, do not believe addresses um, needs um, and service provision for individuals. So obviously 
um, something a little more succinct than what I just said, but um, putting in um, a line about why um, it makes sense to divert people from incarceration rather than furthering mm -hmm. incarceration and what end that serves. I'm wondering, remember the document that this may be about two or three years ago now, but um, we created a document on some of that language. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we can pull from that. Great idea. Um, to add into this. And I, I'm assuming you have all of that information, Chris. All right. Thank you. Um, but I think that's a good. And also, I think, you know, a lot of times, um, I think unintentionally we end up creating things and then they kind of say it. And so I think this is a good way to kind of reinvigorate some of that that language that we talked about a few years back. And then I don't remember as I sit here, and maybe Simon will remember or Chris or Stephanie, whether we talked about in this committee diversion. There are various types of diversion. There's diversion before charges are filed. There's diversion after charges are filed, but what's called pre-plea diversion. And then there is sort of a post-plea diversion where somebody uh, might plead and their sentence would be diverted, which is not technically really diversion, but we have something similar to that in Contra Costa as well. So I don't know if we want to clarify. Um, I think from our perspective is early in the system as you can um, divert folks who not even have charges file if possible. So a, a post-arrest pre-filing um, diversion or a diversion that avoids arrest would be preferable. I imagine Simon's gonna say it would be hard to sort of prescribe where that falls and where the DA's office is comfortable putting that, but it might be helpful for the committee to see it is our belief that diversion should occur as early as possible in the criminal legal process so as to avoid you know, this, the, the sort of barrier that even having um, charges filed presents to someone, because I think we're asked, we're using diversion as a very broad umbrella term, but in the technical sense, when you get um, into the life of a criminal case, it can hit at various points. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a good point, especially to when you're talking about young people going through the process as well. And I can't remember if we... Yeah. And having language, actually, Ellen and I are not going to be far apart on this. Um, if you saw my notes, Ellen, I was going to say that um, diversion versus incarceration, that there's really a larger part of that. That's sort of at the tip of the iceberg would be incarceration. But for most uh, low level misdemeanor offenses, we're not talking about incarceration. There's far greater barriers that impact people whether that's um, education, employment, housing, um, even getting a, a loan, uh, knowing that somebody is, has a, a pending case can be a barrier. Um, and so while I agree, we can certainly have language in there that talks about diversion versus incarceration. Those other barriers, um, which impact far more people who are charged with a crime while that case is pending adjudication, um, is something I think we could highlight here. And, and for that reason, Ellen, um, I think that the the sooner that the diversion uh, is available, we certainly shouldn't preclude it because there are going to be people that uh, you know have cases that are filed, and we don't want to say, "Hey, this was only a pre-filing diversion; you're not eligible for it because cases have been filed." But if we can put an emphasis on pre-filing diversion, um, that that's not an issue at all, from my perspective. I'm wondering from Chris, can you remind me with that other document that we created? Did we present that to um the full body? I'm I'm pretty sure we did. Um, I mean, and I can go back and, and find it. Um, I just don't think so. So the beauty of this, uh, to to walk it back just a little bit, um, is this is something that seems um, you know primarily concerns uh, sort of one office, really, right? Which would mean there's not the same, um, there's nothing wrong with uh, sort of in a, in, a, in these sort of uh, ongoing reports that we'd be making to like the equity committee and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with like um, highlighting these things, but it's not like we need the same level of approval. Um, if it's something that the DA 
office's office is willing to move. At least, you know, that's the way that um, I understand that. Um, and so I think with that, with those guidelines that we created, right, which probably I think writ large, we just need to bring back um, and they could be sort of an attached to addendum to this or, you know, considered, uh, you know, just a, a part of, you know, the the overall uh, sort of endeavor. I mean, it'll be a few more pages, but it's OK. Um, we can I, I think a lot of the things you guys are touching on are in there. But I think once we did, uh, once the body, I, I believe the body approved them. Once they did, we just didn't know what to do with them, right? Like we had done that work and then it's like, where are they going, right? To whom, for what? Uh, so again, there has been a preliminary conversation with DA Beckton and she was open to all of this. Um, so I think, you know, in light of that, sort of reviving those, because again, I do think they, they would have touched on uh, the majority of what's being covered here. Um, I'm again, never opposed to revising or changing language here. Um, but if that language is in a document that's already been developed um, and it, you know, if we attach it and it looks like it says all of the things that you would want it to say, that may be a, an even quicker way to move it forward. Um, and I'm curious if, because I mean, ideally, I I would like to, do these things like as as soon as we can now i don't want to do it so soon that we're not being careful um and we're not uh executing well but i wonder if by the time we're ready to um move this forward whether that's i mean obviously we have a um we have a full body meeting in september right coming up so the question is could this go in the full by uh could this go in the subcommittee report stephanie uh particularly with that guideline language in it uh for a discussion at which point you still have the opportunity to make the revisions that have been uh requested here if they're not sufficiently covered in the guidelines and then they it that that language can actually move uh versus you know needing to come back look at it again um you know make a bunch of iterative changes and then, you know, have to wait until like the next full body meeting, which would be a few months later. Um, it I don't think it's a huge deal either way, but I really like the idea that the diversion subcommittee is able to. This is like your primary charge, right, is uh, eligibility criteria for uh, youth and adult populations. So it would be huge to be able to move this. And I wonder if um, if we have already done some legwork years ago uh that actually lends itself to to being able to move us forward maybe more quickly than we're anticipating um what are other folks thoughts on going back to what chris said there is an opportunity we have a, a meeting in a couple of weeks to present this language um with some of the the additions that um, we've heard or waiting till our next but um, waiting till our next committee meeting to kind of relook at this language, see what language we can pull from um, the previous document that we had to move forward, knowing that it would be a few more months before we shared it with the committee, the full body. I think we should share with the full body now and, and keep things moving forward as quickly as we can. And if Chris is even able to present any of that language at that point if he finds it um or I mean I think that there, there are just one or two small things we would potentially add to this but that the bigger the more important part of the process is hearing from the whole group of if folks feel like there's something we've missed and so getting to that point earlier rather than later um which is Chris's right idea I think any other thoughts and I think also this would give us an opportunity, um, not saying the other work that we've done just still is, you know, on the back burner, but this is a good opportunity for us to start revisiting um, that because now we do have something that we can actually kind of move on. Um, so I think it would be important for us to bring that other document back um, to the forefront. 
because it's been probably a couple of years since we've actually looked at that. Maybe three. So the proposal would be to present this along with that other document at the same time for review to the full body. Well, to only present this oh. with the revisions. Okay. But the language that you all are speaking of that they want to insert is in that other document. Mm -hmm. And Chris could pull some of that language um, to the to make to the additions to this. So we can present to, it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can present it on the 21st. Okay. Just want to be clear. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other thoughts from committee members? And before we move on to public comment, um, just want to welcome Shante. Shante, if you just well, Shante, if you could <laughs> <laughs> introduce yourself. Hi, Lashante Smith. Um, excuse me, I'm having like an allergy breakout right now. Um, director of student services um, and behavior supports. School climate over in West Contra Costa Unified School District. Thank you. All right, so we'll open it up now to public comment on this agenda item. I think I see something in the chat. I think that was him referencing his birthday. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't have any public comment. <laughs> any public comment in the room? No? Okay, and was this a voting item? This was a voting item, right? Or no, it was not. Okay. Okay, so everyone um, is in agreement that we'll make those changes, pull in some um, language from our previous document on criteria, um, and we'll present this so we can get some feedback from the full, full body. All right, sounds great. All right, so we are going to move on to our next agenda item, which is oh, our presentation on restorative justice from Casey. Thank you, Stephanie. Do you mind if I open it up for you, Casey? That would be fantastic. Great. <laughs> okay. So we're really, RJ is really excited about um, our uh, effort to launch a restorative justice initiative. Um, we received Measure X um, funding to establish a uh, community-based restorative justice effort. And so uh, Casey is with us. She is a consultant that is going to be project managing um, the project for us. Um, there's a whole host of elements to it, which she will be um, uh, presenting to you guys today. And we thought that this was a natural fit for what the Diversion Committee has been considering over the last couple of years to be quite mm -hmm. frank. And um, there's some direct alignment as well with um, some of the our job recommendations. So um, ORJ will be administering the, the effort, but we really see this as a countywide, as an opportunity countywide to look at and identify where restorative justice um, practices, approaches, and programming is happening, not only just throughout the criminal justice system, but also in um, and throughout the community, as well as in our adjacent systems where um, some of this work is taking place. So with that, I will turn it over to Casey, who will share a little bit more about our work. Thank you, Patrice. Yeah. And um, Gariana, do you have the presentation as well? Yes, I have it in the agenda, and I also have it. Do you want me to pull it up separately? You can pull it up so that we could go along with the presentation and then I'll ping back to the recommendations of the racial justice task force and how the work of this restorative justice initiative aligned with some of the things that the task force overall is doing broadly, as well as what this particular divergent subcommittee is doing. Um, so again, my name is, is Casey Rain. Um, I am the principal of Rain Community Development. And um, as Petri said, we are beginning the, the initial stages of this restorative justice initiative. Um, and next slide, please, Dariana. I want to make sure that I'm really clear about what, what we are doing here is that um, we understand here in Contra Costa County that there is a goal to broadly adopt 
throughout a number of systems, the philosophies and practice associated with restorative justice. Um, we also understand that what the, the Measure X subcommittee and what was embraced through the Board of Supervisors was um, really looking at this desired shift from criminal and juvenile legal systems that emphasize confinement and compliance to those that prioritize and foster hope, healing, rehabilitation, and resiliency whenever appropriate and possible. And so with that as a framework, we are engaging in a multi-step um, process where what we are gonna be doing is the needs assessment to figure out what we want. And then the next phase of the process is actually the launch of an initiative to do actually that work, embedded support principles and practices of programming. So the team, um, next slide please, Gariana, includes myself, uh, Casey Rain, uh, my colleague, Bright Star Olson, Peter Kim um, with Bright Research Group, and our colleagues, Earl Sims, Amina Elster, and Malachi Scott. Um, all three of those latter colleagues all have lived experience um, in various ways with the justice system and are practicing restorative justice experts. So they themselves hold circles um, and do RJ work in the community, uh, primarily in Alameda County, also some work in San Francisco County. So we are bringing some system practice expertise into this as well. Um, yes, please, Gariana, yes, you're doing just right. <laughs> so I want to be clear that this work is going to be happening in, in multiple phases. And um, the first phase is what we're kicking off right now with the needs assessment. This is about a six month process. Um, uh, it involves both background research, attending meetings like this is a component of the background research. We've been attending other our job committee meetings, task force meetings, CAB meetings, um, trying to pay really close attention to the dialogue that's happening in the community. Went to a Desaulnier sponsored town hall meeting on youth mental health to just hear what people are saying in this community. We're also doing key informant interviews, talking to a number of community stakeholders, hoping to actually talk with a number of either yourselves or you know those that you recommend from your offices um, as part of the key informant interview process. Also, a number of other people that we're working on um, in partnership with Patrice and the Office of Reentry and Justice. But sometimes it's, you know, hearing from someone like you and saying, oh, you really need to talk to. So we're going to be trying to listen to a lot of people. Um, those conversations are going to help us frame what's going on in the community. And we're looking at doing a formal launch of the work um, in late September. I do have a date to announce, which is Tuesday, September 26th. It will be in the morning. Mm -hmm. All right. If you could just do a save the date, we're hoping to get everything confirmed with meeting location and time, and then we'll get a save the date notice out. Um, but at that community launch workshop where we're really gonna be engaging um, a range of system partners, meeting system partners, those engaged with the juvenile and criminal justice system who primarily work for justice entities of the government and non-system partners, <laughs> meaning those who become, who belong and are engaged with community-based organizations, educational settings, faith-based groups, but those who primarily have some background and awareness and understanding of restorative justice principles and practices. And that's really gonna set the framework and the tone and help us define our shared vision and parameters. From that, we launch into our more community-driven, exploration of interests, needs, um, sentiment strategies, and really doing some community groundwork through a community survey and focus group. All of that information comes back to a steering committee that we're looking at forming in October. More about the formation of that will be discussed at the community launch workshop. The steering committee stays with the project ongoing for a multiple year period. Um, and they are part of the process of picking and selecting and defining how we will use the Measure X funds that are allocated to restorative justice initiative 
how we will allocate those funds. So there, there is both a review of the needs assessment and the planning process and the recommendation, but the bigger work is around making decisions around implementation. Wrapping up this needs assessment, of course, we will you know, develop you know, a report and all of that then goes into, next slide please, um, really getting into the weeds of the project design. We do anticipate that there will be some kind of agreement on what is needed that might result in a desired scope of work and RFP or scope of works, plural, and RFPs, plural, around what we are looking for. Um, it will also probably lead to some kind of agreements about what we're doing and what kind of tools we are using. <laughs> Again, that seems back to this diversion um, subcommittee, as you guys are also looking at some ways that you are defining practice, defining what is diversion, um, defining how we even think about restorative justice within the context of diversion, who might be eligible, what criteria might be, things like that. So there will be different ways that we will pin, pin back to different committees and subcommittees such as this. Ultimately, what we are looking for is if we can really work the timing right, keeping my fingers crossed, right? <laughs> We get a scope of work and an RFP put together early 2024. It goes out to the community. We review and vet them. We can start looking at contracting July and August. Certainly by December 2024, we've got some trainings going. We have some programs ready to start rolling out. I know it takes a while to hire and train after an RFP goes out and somebody's awarded and contracting with. So trying to give that full process a full year. And then we can really actually start using our Measure X funds to really do work on the ground, um, ideally no later than January 2025. And then we can come back um, and really say, okay, this is how it's working. This is what it's working. This is what we need to do to sustain things. Um, some of it might be direct services. Some of it might be training. That is all what the needs assessment is supposed to be figuring out. But yeah, it is a two-year process. Needs assessment kicks it off and then a lot of implementation work. Um, so, you know, I do wanna say just a final word as we start at just in conclusion um, to here, and if you can just move the slides, uh, Ariana. Um, you know, oftentimes when, when we do this work, we, we have like a clear problem statement and you know, that drives the solution, and then we have some measures of success. I would say that we're still building that model, and it will take a lot of input from a lot of different, um, both community and institutional state systems actors, uh, both individuals, and maybe even running it through, you know, larger collectives of, of employees who have vested interests in different things to make sure that, you um, we're implementing something that is um, feasible, timely, within budget, um, smart E. I don't know if you guys use the, the smart language here about specific and measurable, all those kinds of things. I like adding the E at the end for equity driven, right? It's not just smart, it's smart E. Um, there will be a balance in all of this that I just want to state at the outset is that some things appropriately need to, to be run with and through our system partners, and some things need to be run with and through our community partners. And I think part of the work is really understanding, you know, where those overlaps occur, how the communication and coordination occurs in a way that, that lifts and raises, um, you know, both our community partners to, to embrace everything about wrongdoing and community healing so we can avoid any system involvement. And then understanding that if things do get to system involvement, that there's again, other ways, additional ways with, within and next to the traditional justice system that we can also plug into to really meet these Measure X um, goals. And um, and that's, that's really where I'm coming from. So I just wanted to frame kind of the why and the, the the approach that we as the consulting team are taking. 
And that concludes my presentation to this committee. And I'm happy to take questions. If you have questions about the process or about me or about more about our team members, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from subcommittee members? Yeah, this is really um, exciting and I think much needed for Contra Costa, which is imagine the vision of what the board saw when they allocated this funding to study and, and really look at our restorative options and build them here in Contra Costa. Um, when you get to that implementation phase and you're talking about things like cost partner trainings or launch mm -hmm. program activities, mm -hmm. can you describe in a little more detail kind of what's the scope there and what what is envisioned in terms of who are the partners and what what, what are the trainings you know how many so I want to be really clear that in some ways what we're hoping for the the stakeholder workshop is a little bit of narrowing our scope mm -hmm. you know right now when we when I think about restorative justice principles and practices and programs. Um, some things can occur, you know, within the legal justice system. And I'm going to, to specifically say post-arrest, um, post um, making a referral to, to the district attorney's office, you, you know, for, for a juvenile or filing, you know, any kind of filing or anything like that. Um, some things can happen you know, in terms of a re-entry analysis. And, and part of it is also listening to our partners over at the cab who are doing a lot of thinking around re-entry work. Um, within the cross-partner trainings, it would really be dependent upon um, where we, we define that scope. Are we staying within the legal criminal justice system? Are we really working, looking at doing deeper work in partnership with the schools? Are we looking at doing deeper work in partnership with law enforcement or our custody officers? Or do we really looking at, um, you know, things where it's like, well, this is what, you know, we mean by holistic defense. And this is how holistic defense partners differently with prosecution and, and you know, when and how are holistic defense appropriate and making sure that, you know, even things like maybe, you know, maybe you understand that, maybe, you know, your more senior attorneys understand that, but you need to have something for, you know, your incoming, um, you know, I don't know what you call them here in this county, but your, your, your level one, you know, prosecutors or defense attorneys or something that, you know, informs, you know, your partners in the judiciary, you know, this is what we are trying to do. Can you go along with it? So it could be at that level and it could be much more mundane. It could be, okay, we have selected these partners and these partners are going to be working in concert and in coordination with the public defender's office, with with the district attorney's office, with the, you know, probation department. Um, here's how they work, and you need to know how they work so that, you know, you understand the difference between, um, you know, something that happens uh, pre plea versus post plea, and what the, the consequences are. You understand what it means at, about reporting to the courts or not reporting to the courts. So I think there'll be a lot of work that we have to do. A in the needs assessment and B in the project design to figure out what trainings we need. For some of the trainings, which are macro kind of like vision and approach, we're going to be messaging all the way through. And then my understanding is that there's some effort through a recent grant of that was received through the probation department to do some more trainings. I understand that the County Office of Education is also kind of working with different school districts on training. So not duplicating training, but being more focused on training. So can I have one more thing? So just to answer your question really directly, um, Ellen, implementation, what those program activities might be, and as she was stating, what, what those specific cross-partner trainers will look like is going to be determined by our project design. So it's yet to be determined now which is why we're doing all this sort of information gathering. There's so much that's happening in the space of RJ in, in the county, just in general, small scale, big, big scale, and sometimes just housed within specific departments or, you know, even at school, this 
school sites from Mason versus school district versus the uh, office of ed. And so we're trying to comb all of that information together to then hone in on where can we best apply these resources to one that's low hanging fruit and probably high priority that is articulated by all of the uh, important stakeholders and community. So when she's saying, you know, we're gathering all this information and trying to find the overlap, that's what we're, we're, what we're trying to do. So it may sound like, well, what are you guys doing? We're, we're trying to determine that. <laughs> we're trying to determine that, but we don't want to come out the gate doing some, creating some design where we could very well be duplicating what already exists. Yeah, so that's not big. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I, think, I think what's interesting about what, what I see in Contra Costa and folks, you know, Stephanie would have her, her own vantage point kind of from the CBO side, but I do think there are these, these spaces, you know, in, in the youth space, there's obviously some restorative programming, there's some CBO programming, but there is a giant, um, you know, humongous number of cases on the adult side that go into a criminal court system where I can tell you there is very little that's restorative about any of it. And that is a very, that's very high volume. So I imagine you're going to have a report with like exciting, innovative pilot programs and great approaches and CEOs doing cool things and great stuff on the youth side. But I think if we, if we, we mapped out every single person touched by our criminal legal system in Contra Costa, you would see a lot of adult side folks that are not at all um, having the advantage of any sort of restorative approaches or programming. So um, I'm, I'm really interested to read um, and, and hear what you gather in our office. Of course, we'd love, love to participate um, in any of this and I really see the need for it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so excited to hear that in this meeting that both your office and DA Becton's office have new data analysts. Um, that was a very exciting thing to hear. So, you know, probably down the road, I will be bugging <laughs> people because I think it is important that we look at um, not just where the sentiment says, but, you know, we need to roll out something that will um, impact a sufficient number of individuals to move the needle. Mm -hmm. So we can do great work with 21 young people, but what we really need to do is really think about, well, what's going to impact 2100 annually? And so we're, we'll have to kind of navigate some of that stuff. Um, I think one of the things that I'm excited, I'm excited about this whole project, um, but I think one thing that I've seen in our county, I'm glad LaShante is here too for this one, um, but uh, what I've seen in the county, I really think there needs to be a lot of education around what restorative practices are, um, because I think restorative, especially just saying restorative justice has kind of become <laughs> this catch-all for um, what people think diversion should be or some type of diversion should be, and there are many different types of restorative practice that can be applied to different um, types of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for justice, um, the system stakeholders, as well as CBOs as, um, too, to understand, you know, there's these different avenues and pathways um, where restorative practices can be applied and there's different ways to implement it. Um, so a young person that gets caught up in something may not need to go through the rigorous because Restore um, is a rigorous, rigorous program that they're going through, but maybe it is a circle that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, and that takes time. And so it's not like a really quick kind of solution to things. It takes time, it takes training. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a conversation that we really haven't had in the county. Mm -hmm. um, because it's become kind of trendy to do restorative justice. And so I'm, I hope like with this, we can really kind of dive deeper into what it means. We can dive deeper into um, even how different system stakeholders and community um, people can use like nonviolent communication when they're communicating with clients and when they're communicating with each other. I think that would be very important for us to look into because it's not just about applying a program, but we also should be modeling what we're um, saying should happen in the county. 
Any other comments from committee members? Okay, I'll open it up to the public. I thought I saw your hand, but no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just I really just want to echo what, what, what you said. I, I thought it was all just so well stated and that it's I think it's really important to try to put it out there and, and, and educate people as much as possible. Um I, I you know I first learned about it about 10 years ago and I went through like a 40 hour training at Seeds in, in Berkeley. And and you know, you know, my hope is that it's it replaces what's what we have now. Is that it's something that just entirely new. It's a whole new approach to how we how we deal with 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 people that have struggled and have fallen on you know maybe due time for a period of time. But that it's it's my hope just that it, it completely you know restructures what we what we have because I think what we have now is um it's pretty destructive and. Um, I also um, I, I also had just a uh, another comment just about the schools and I think it's really as a former retired public school teacher I just think it's really important to start young and I know that there's so many more adults that are impacted I just heard but I think if we really want it to become like a cultural shift which is like my hope it, it, that it needs to start young it needs to start with the teachers and the principals and to understand you know rather than just painting somebody as good and bad or right or wrong, but it's just, it's kind of a whole new approach and, and bringing parents in and family members. And then I guess just my last thing for um, this reign is that just in terms of the needs assessment, you know, I guess I would just ask, you know, who are, who are you, who are you listening to? Who are you learning from? And I guess just to make it as wide as possible, because I, just as a general member of the public, I just attend so many different meetings and I feel like I hear frequently, it's like, well, we weren't heard, we weren't included, we weren't thought of. Is, is that a question that I should respond to? Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you. You know, hearing from a sufficiently broad and diverse group of community members is critical. Um, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to have conversations with, you know, individual conversations with, you know, thousands of people. Um, what we are trying and hoping that we can do is do a community survey. A big piece of what we are exploring for our community survey design Actually, um, Stephanie gets at what you were talking about, about um, RJ has no real definition. There's lots of different practices for different kinds of circumstances. And we're hoping that we can kind of broadly understand people's sentiments and approaches and readiness for RJ across the community. And so those kinds of things would be looked at, you know, both by kind of like, what kind of person you are, what kind of income level you might have, where in the county might you live, what is your professional affiliation with schools or law enforcement or something like that. Um, the goal for that survey is we'd like to distribute it very, very widely through as many networks as possible. So ideally what would happen is we would give it to, you know, say, say, Office of Reentry and Justice, and they send it out to their network. But it would also be wonderful <laughs> if there are other networks. Hope Solutions, mm -hmm. I get your mailing list. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, it's on the 26th. I got to remember to like, like get it out because I got a party to get to that night to hear about what's going on with Hope Solutions. You know, so your mailing list. You know, Stephanie Rice has a mailing list. West Contra Costa Unified has a mailing list. People have ways to encourage others in the community, and especially, I, I, I'm gonna lean a little bit into the schools and our community-based organizations to help ideally ask people to share and distribute this survey. I think the only thing that we're gonna ask is, you know, do you live or work in the county? <laughs> then, then you get to answer the, the survey, but there's no, there's nothing that's gonna be triggering on there. You're not gonna have any, questions that, that that should be triggering. So we, we would even encourage you to do it. Nice. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? 
No. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Casey. Looking forward to um, seeing how everything unfolds. Okay. Anything else you wanted to add, Patrice, before we move on? All to say um, thank you to the Divergent Committee for allowing us um, space to share this back with you guys. And uh, we look forward to bringing more info back to you um, as we move this train on down the <laughs> track. Thank you. Okay. So our next um, agenda item is our discussion on our meeting schedule. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So, um, it didn't come up in a diversion meeting, but I think it came up in a full body committee, a full body um, meeting around um, changing up the schedules a little bit. Um, I think from personal experience um, and chairing the committee and knowing how busy everyone is, um, these monthly meetings come up very quickly. I mean, <laughs> it's like, it weekly. yeah, it's like lightning fast. And um, what tends to happen is that work that we may have gotten from a previous meeting, we actually haven't had enough time to coordinate and get that work done. And then we have another meeting coming up. And so um, then we don't really have a chance or an opportunity to, I think, dig in sufficiently to things that we need to work on. Um, and so the proposal is that um, we move to every other month. And I think we've kind of actually done that naturally, uh, just given how schedules have been. Um, and so I think if we went to an every other month schedule, that would give us some time to work on tasks that come up in those meetings um, to set the the other meetings <laughs> that come up. So like working on criteria, um, gathering language to add to different documents. It'll just give us a, more time and room and space um, to do the best that we can. And also keeping in mind that everyone is busy all of us have different commitments, and we really want to honor um, people's time um, and make sure we're we're using each other's time as efficiently um, as possible. So I wanted to put that out. I don't think is there anything else, either Patrice or Chris, you wanted to add. The only thing I will add is that so what you're seeing in front of you is the as a current monthly schedule for the remainder of the year. If you wish to go to every other month, as you see, you'll have, well, September 21st is going to be canceled. Mm -hmm. September 21st, Diversion Subcommittee canceled in lieu of having the quarterly meeting. Mm -hmm. So you will be back here next month, but just not for Diversion. And um, But if you were to go to every other month, that means your next one will likely be that um, uh, October 19th and then uh, subsequently uh, December 21st, which is really getting close to Christmas time. You're probably going to end up canceling that one anyway or yeah. rescheduling it at the very least. So just some things to keep in mind. And if and also if this is, uh, is this kind of a meeting recurrence or frequency is of the wish of this body, then we can also start working on next year's assuming all of you are going to stay on the same uh, committee. We can work on next year's calendar as well. Mm -hmm. um, and get those dates out to you too. We started just as a context for folks, we definitely, the whole body started late in the year. Um, so um, just know that in, in, in terms of approval of, of appointments uh, of, of members, and then also just kind of getting the work started. You know, obviously the, the full body has had an enormous amount of tension of, uh, in terms of what's been going on. Um, in, in Antioch and Pittsburgh PD and all of that, but just to get us back into the groove of things again, in addition to still continuing that work, that's just kind of where the de delay, so to speak, kind of took place. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to lift that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm about that. I think it's a great idea to move it to bi monthly, give us more time to work on things. Mm 
Yeah, I, I agree. I wonder if there's a way to make sure we don't lose a December meeting if we move it up a week or something like that. I agree that the 21st is like, you know. Yeah. Because um, I don't think, I mean, yeah. Um, but I wonder how you're doing right. it the week before. Mm -hmm. We can definitely look at that um, earlier in the month mm -hmm. so we're not canceling that meeting. But uh, for the most part, folks do, they're fine with the bi-monthly schedule. Sounds like, okay. And does this time still work for everyone? Day and location. It works for me. Okay. Do we want to look at December right now to see if we can find um, a date that works for everyone? Let's do it. Um, so, oops, let me get to the right month first. <laughs> uh, so, other Thursdays would be maybe the 7th or the 14th of December. Are the other committees? Yeah, so we do have, let me get to mine. Okay. So the other days, like one of the committees are on the oh, same page. Usually, on the oh, thank you. The committee engagement has a twelve fourteen date from three to five. Yeah. yeah. So we have the twelve, um, and then I believe the fourteenth, which is what you just mentioned, right? Um, mm -hmm. So we could do like a one to three if well, that's gotta what time is the um community engagement meeting? That one's from three to five. And that's on the 14th. Mm -hmm. I mean we could do a one to three. We tend to get out early. Um the, the only request that I, that if I can make mm -hmm. The community engagement um, subcommittee, um, they meet at 50 Douglas, the probation, uh -huh. considering that we kind of staff. If we could have you guys at the same location, that mm -hmm. would make things a little bit easier. <laughs> at one uh, to three. Does that work for folks? Okay. Okay. Very cool. So from one to three on December 14th, we will have you guys. Um, so change of location and December date at the same time. All right. Teresa so said 50 Douglas. 50 Douglas Martinez. Mm -hmm. We'll get that updated. All right, thank you. I mean, we're just moving along just so swiftly. I appreciate this so much. Um, okay, so next steps. Um Next steps, Chris will be making those edits to um, the criteria language and we'll be sharing it at the, um, the full body meeting on the 21st to get feedback from them. Um, also, we'll start at, at our next meeting, Chris, we can talk a little bit more about um, the other document that we worked on and maybe how we wanna start bringing that back and thinking about that planning. Um, I'm sure something will go out to the committee and we can share with our different networks about the upcoming um, restorative justice community launch. Um, so looking forward, actually, I won't, yeah. Yeah, I won't be here, but <laughs> which I'm not happy about, but <laughs> there are other workshops coming. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll be out of town during that time, but uh, let's see anything else. I'm missing anything. Think that's it. Uh, one oh, one yeah. last thing. Um, we we can and we don't have to 
do this now, but it's something that we should be thinking about. Uh, we are, uh, it looks like we are switching to the bi-monthly. Um, so in terms of the actual criteria, the actual list of offenses, uh, we could go back to having smaller groups from this committee begin to look at those, uh, starting with the one that was already developed um, for adults, just to make sure that still looks about right, given it's been a while since we've looked at it and then looking at uh, young people and uh, the offenses for them as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for that reminder. Um, so someone will be in touch about scheduling those meetings. Um, okay, I think that's it. All right, we are adjourned till our next meeting on October 19th. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Did you get about a little less than that? Your approach.